Uh, now, for more, we're joined now by the former chairman of the FA, Greg Dyke. Lovely to have you on the programme. Uh, good to uh, see you here good this to Sunday be morning. Here. Thanks for coming on. Um, we just had that doorstep from uh, my colleague James Matthews uh, about Manchester United. Now, of course, you used to be a director of Manchester United I before did. the Glazers took over. I think you warned at the time the takeover wasn't in the interest of the club. Are you pleased to see the back of them? Oh, I think all Manchester United fans will be pleased to see the back of them. I think they've... Uh, some of what Christian, uh, Christian Ronaldo said this week was, I thought, quite interesting when he basically said, look, going back there after 15 years, the ground has deteriorated, the training ground has deteriorated. I think they haven't spent the money on the club and they've done it because they've been taking a large amount of money out. Now, having said that, football fans would always want uh, money to stay in the club and not, and not be paid out to shareholders. So, But I do think... I think Manchester United fans generally will be celebrating today. I was interested to hear you mention the Ronaldo interview then. You agreed with some of what he said. Well, I thought his point about what's happened to the club over a period of years, I mean, there's no doubt the money has not been invested. I mean, Old Trafford used to be, you know, a ground ahead of its time. It's no longer like that. Uh, the training ground is no longer like that. The world catches up and you have to spend capital. Mm. And they haven't spent it. They've taken the money out. I just wonder if there's a bigger point here as well, not just about Old Trafford. You know, in Germany, for example, they've got rules to stop a single owner having too much dominance uh, in controlling clubs. Supporters have a much greater role as well. You know, is there an issue with English clubs? You know, they can be bought and sold almost like second-hand cars. Oh, I think there is. I mean, there's no doubt. Uh, I mean, in Germany, 51% is owned by the fans. Uh, it was interesting that when the European Super League came up, mm. there were no German clubs there mm. involved because their fans didn't want that. Um, I, you, I think you've got to look at what's happening to English football and who's buying it. I mean, my, my position is increasingly the Premier League has become to be dominated by foreign owners, foreign managers, foreign players. And so you think something needs to change. What, what, what do you think should change and who should try and Well, I think we Well, I think we might be too late, mm. oddly, in terms of ownership. Mm. Uh, I mean, if, if the Glazers sell the club uh, for four or five billion pounds, this is what people are talking about, then whoever buys it is going to want some sort of return on their money. Mm. They're bound to. But you could change the rules, though, right? Uh, it's very difficult to change the rules if, if clubs have changed for that sort of money. Mm. How do you change them? Mm. Uh, the FA can't change them. It's, it would require uh, a law. I think you could so easily make it that there have to be fans' representatives on the board. Mm. I think that would be good. Idea. I mean, I'm involved, I've been involved with Brentford, which are now a Premier League club, and uh, their fans' representatives are on the board. Wonderful club. I've been to a few games at Brentford, I have to say. It's well, it's I was chairman for a while, for quite a long while, but I was chairman in the days when we used to have a whip round to pay the wages. <laughs> uh, today it's brilliantly run and uh, I think it's it's a big success story. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm keen to talk to you about the World Cup uh, as well. Um, what do you make of the decision to hold it in Qatar? Well, it was always a ridiculous decision and it was corrupt, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you have to accept that most of the people who voted for Qatar, uh, or, or, or the executive who voted for it, um, most of them were driven out of football because for corrupt reasons, mm. for corruption. Mm. Uh, I, it was a bad decision. It didn't meet... I mean, the, FIFA's own safety committee recommended strongly against it, which is why in the end it had to be moved from the summer mm. to the winter. Mm. Uh, it isn't big enough. It hasn't got... You know, if you wanted to put a, a World Cup in the Middle East, first of all, you'd have had to accept that it wasn't going to play in the summer. But secondly, you'd have done it through four or five countries. You wouldn't mm. put it... You know, there are six stadiums in one city. It's, mm. it's an, it was a silly decision, I think. Mm. And, and that's with, before you get into all the... Other issues. Yeah, yeah. You talk about obviously the uh, concerns about women's rights, about um, LGBT rights as well. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about Laura McAllister, to, to Laura McAllister shortly, who was ordered to remove her rainbow bucket hat when she went in to watch a Wales game there. Um, I'm just interested why, in your. Why would they do that? Yeah. I mean, that, that's just a stupid thing to do to get a lot of publicity for mm. something that they're embarrassed about anyway. Mm. What do you make of the? Because obviously there was there was a talk, wasn't there, that you know Kane and others would wear the rainbow armband. They then backed down because they would get a yellow card for it. What did you make of that? Well, it had to be better organised than it was. Mm -hmm. If the six or seven European countries that were doing it had yeah. all felt so strongly about it, they could have said to FIFA, we're doing this. 
And if you don't like it, we're all out of here. Mm -hmm. And FIFA is not a brave organisation, but I mean, if it can pick one off after the other, which is what it did, mm -hmm. it wasn't a problem. But I think if the seven countries, the FAs of those seven countries, mm -hmm. had got together and said, look, we're, this is what we are doing, mm -hmm. FIFA would have had to have backed down. Has it uh, spoiled your ability to enjoy the World Cup? Um, not really. I enjoy watching football. Uh, so, I, and I have watched quite a lot of games. I don't think yet it's a great World Cup, but it, you know, it's very early days um, in terms of the football. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think it was a poor decision by, by FIFA, the, the original decision, and I do think that has tarnished mm -hmm. uh, the World Cup this time. And I, I would think FIFA, who is now under different sort of management, I think FIFA must be just hoping it's waiting for it to be over so they can get back to normal. And, and normal will be America and Canada. Mm. Is there anyone, any team in particular you've got your eye on then? Who do you think has got the best chance of winning it? Well, I, when I was chairman of the FA, I set England the target of winning in, in Qatar. Uh, I don't think that's impossible, although I think the French look pretty dangerous. Yeah. Uh, and Brazil look pretty good. Yeah. So you think that it's not impossible then for England to win? Oh, it? no, I think England... England, uh, I mean, they had a very good first game, a very average second game, but that's all right. Everybody has an average game. Mm -hmm. They didn't lose. Uh, and I, have, I, I think the manager is very good and I think they've got a, they're in with the chance. I think they could well be, you know, they're, in with, they're one of sort of four clubs, four, four countries, I think, who could win it. Uh, now, you obviously used to be director general of the BBC and just with that hat on, um, you know, there's been a lot of political debate recently about the licence fee. You know, the current culture secretary, Michelle Donnellan, previously dubbed it an unfair tax. Do you think it is? Well, it's always been an unfair tax in the sense that it's everybody pays the same regardless of how poor or how rich. The problem with the licence, the issue with the licence fee, I, I believe in the public funding of the BBC. Whether you can find a better way uh, than the licence fee is what the discussion needs to be about. But it's got to be a better way that doesn't give more power for the politicians mm. to run, to, to, to influence the BBC. Is there a better way that you can see? Or? Well, I spent many years... <laughs> and I think there are other ways of funding, of funding the BBC from the public purse. Um, mm. But if you look now, I personally don't think... This is a big issue now mm. because I do think we're in the last, we're in the dying days of, of this government, uh, and I think, I mean, my my impression has always been that the, the government of the day in the end doesn't like the BBC, but the opposition does. So, mm. the BBC gets a better period when a new government comes in, and I suspect that's what's going to happen in the next two years. Uh, and just finally, uh, the upcoming uh, media bill also expected to have a decision on Channel Four privatisation. And what's your position on that? Well, there was no argument for privatising Channel 4. It was a ridiculous uh, decision or thought in the first place. And the Secretary of State who had it said, well, they, they can, if they get privatised, they can, they can challenge uh, the big players in the world that have emerged, you know, the, the streamers. I, that was never real. The only way that Channel 4 makes any sense if you turn it into a private operation and sell it is if it's part of something that's much bigger. Mm. And I can't see the reason for doing that. OK. Um, really interesting to have you uh, on the programme. Good to talk a bit about football as well as on politics, Shane. Thank you.